So here's my bio, and it's uh, pretty up to date. Uh, my colleague Dan Klein, this is his bio. And I wanted to start off kind of talking a little bit about contamination in the clean room and where it comes from and why this is such an important topic today. So first off, you have your facility, so your facility design, the age of your facility. Uh, over time, things like the duct work in the facility and the flooring when you have uh, epoxy, vinyl, or terrazzo flooring, that sealant layer on the floor breaks down. And uh, as those things start to happen and the facility ages and gets, gets up around 20 years of age, you start to see more and, more and more contamination from your aging facility. So that is a big source of the uh, bio burden over time in the clean room. Another key source is, uh, which accounts for about 15 to 20% of your bio burden contamination in the room, are materials that you bring into the clean room. So that is bags, boxes, intervention equipment, tools, uh, one of the biggest sources here, cell phones. Uh, all of these are potential sources of bio burden uh, that you're bringing in the room, because just think about this, uh, even with carts and cartwheels, when they are wheeled into a room, uh, those wheels are in contact with the floor and you could be spreading spores, fungal or bacterial, into the controlled space. Uh, another big one is operators. They account for about 80 to 85% of the bio burden contamination in a clean room. And uh, if you think about this, your operators shed millions of skin flakes and millions of particles a day. And it's on those surfaces that viable microorganisms can live and essentially contaminate the room or the surfaces in the room. Uh, another key thing can be the processes. So what type of process are you doing in that clean room? Are you making tablets? Are you making powders? Are you making uh, paste? So all these kind of different procedures in the clean room. And we even talk about cold rooms where you might do blood frack. And uh, in these settings, you can have certain degrees of bio burden in the room uh, that are unique. So for example, in cold rooms, we see a lot of molds. We also see Bacillus cereus uh, that can grow under those, say, minus five to five degrees C temperatures. Uh, utilities, so water for injection systems, USP water systems, uh, those can be a source for biofilms and bio burden in the room. Uh, another th key thing can be compressed gases, so helium, argon, nitrogen, and you can get some organisms that can live in aerobic or anaerobic environments like cutie bacterium acnes uh, that can be a source of bio burden in that room. Equipment and where you place the equipment in a clean room, that can certainly be a source of bio burden uh, and a source of uh, ongoing contamination. A good example was a couple weeks ago, I'm teaching a course at PDA and I notice in the room that I'm in, they have a uh, number of these uh, shelves that are in the clean room and the shelf is actually blocking the return vent in the room for the HEPA filtered air. So anytime you block the return vents, that HEPA filtered air, when it hits the surface and then it comes down uh, and goes toward the vent, will not actually get into the vent. So you're blocking airflow in the room, uh, which can stir up contamination. And you can even get what we call these little spin-ups in the room called clean room eddies. So you're not then getting truly HEPA filtered airflow in the room. So this slide is always an important slide. Uh, let me kind of move my thing out of the way here. Uh, but when we look at this, this shows your, uh, your thought process in choosing a new biocidal agent for the clean room. So a new disinfectant, sanitizer, or sterilant. Uh, typically, whenever you look, let's say at a new disinfectant, a phenol or a quat, uh, you have to decide what's the most critical attributes that you need to utilize that product on site. So things like efficacy, so effectiveness, substrate compatibility with different surfaces uh, in the room. You don't want to use something that destroys your surfaces in the clean room or the stainless steel. Uh, by the same token, you don't want to use a product in a clean room that's not effective. It has to be effective against your bio burden. Uh, another key thing would be stability. So how stable is the use dilution and the open container? And those are things that the FDA actually asks for. I've seen warning letters on stability. Uh, safety, is it safe for your operators to use? Is it safe for disposal to go down the drain or do you have to neutralize it? What about rinsing and residues? 
periodically you are going to need to rinse to remove residual buildup in the clean room. So these are the key uh, components here to a disinfectant, an effective disinfectant and validation program. So number, uh, number one component is always the in vitro laboratory testing. So this would be the suspension or time kill study where the microorganism is surrounded 360 degrees by the biocidal agent. Uh, that would give you an idea of A, can I kill the organism and B, and what time frame. Uh, and then another key component is the carrier or coupon testing. And that would tell me, can I actually kill that bio burden on a hard surface that might be in the clean room, uh, that is common in the clean room? That's something else you would want to know about. Uh, then another key component that's actually very important in the industry today, both to FDA and other global regulators uh, like CFDA, uh, MHRA, HPRA, and that is the in situ field trials because you need to be able to show the regulators under worst case conditions uh, that you can control that bio burden in the facility. So that's very important. That's another topic I'm be covering this morning with you. Uh, and then that ongoing environmental monitoring and data trending. So over a six to, month, six to 12 month time point, uh, when you start up a new clean room facility, you should be gathering that environmental trending data to get a feel for and a flavor for what microorganisms do I have in my room? So molds, yeast, uh, bacillus, and uh, any other types of bacteria you might have in that room. Because what you're gonna be doing then is through a risk analysis procedure, determining what organisms uh, that are indigenous to that room are you going to be uh, including in your disinfectant coupon tests. So here are some of the key regulations in the industry and I'll kind of highlight each one. So these are guidance documents and regulations uh, that are important. Number one would probably be USP, so United States Pharmacopeia, uh, General Chapter 1072, which is disinfectants and antiseptics. Uh, regulators place a, a lot of emphasis on this chapter and pharma, biotech, med device, and compounders all will follow a, a lot of the verbiage in this chapter. It is something that's supposed to be updated soon. I know my colleague in industry, Tony Kendall, is working to do some updates on it. He's on that USP expert committee. Uh, there's also an ASTM document out there, the Guide for Evaluation of Clean Room Disinfectants. Uh, my colleague, Dan Klein, is, is part of that group. Uh, there's an ISO document. So I'm involved with the ISO committees at IEST. And that ISO document is ISO 14698 parts one through three. Uh, right now, it's not that well written and doesn't provide a whole lot of guidance, but it does talk about uh, doing a surface evaluation of the clean rooms and uh, deciding what to include in your coupon testing. Then you have PDA's technical report number 70. And I think this is a pretty well written document. It's got several pages dedicated uh, to validation and neutralization and how to conduct those studies. It also even talks about log reduction. Uh, then there's a nice IEST document that I uh, co-authored out there on clean room cleaning and disinfection. And I wrote the section on this uh, related to validation. So that's all your guidance documents and regulations out there uh, directly related to disinfectant validation qualification. I do want to mention a couple of other uh, guidance documents out there. One is the PICS document, and the latest version of the PICS actually states when you do your validation studies, you should be shooting for the minimum contact time. In many cases, that's five or 10 minutes. That's what we see in our industry. Uh, the FDA's aseptic processing guide in the next couple years, you're gonna see them pull that out uh, from 2005 and start to update that again. But that does have a section in it where it talks about doing uh, testing on the suitability and efficacy of the disinfecting agents that you have in your claim room. So it does talk about the need to validate these chemistries. Uh, so that's important. And then there's lots of test methods out there. So before I get deep into these test methods, I wanna mention, when you look at a couple of the recent 483s and warning letters by the Food and Drug Administration, uh, you can see how really important 
uh, having a good sound cleaning and disinfection program is. One of those, and if you're interested, I can provide the links after the webinar. One of those is a recent uh, 483 issued by the FDA to Emergent Biosciences. Emergent is the company that's doing work with the J&J &J vaccine. And regulators went in there and they had several audit findings directly related to ineffective cleaning and disinfection of the rooms and areas where they actually saw contamination from bags in the rooms. Uh, so FDA is looking at these things. There's another one out there related to a cell and gene therapy facility. And uh, they were specifically looking at contamination of that facility as well. So going into the methods here. So the manufacturers of the disinfectants, uh, sanitizers and sterilants, are required to do certain types of testing out there. Uh, when it comes to U.S. EPA uh, in the U.S. and Puerto Rico, we're required to do AOAC uh, testing, which is Association of Official Analytical uh, Communities. I believe it's Chapter 6 uh, that is dedicated to uh, disinfectant claims, sporicide claims, and sanitizer claims, where it spells out uh, the tests that are needed to get a disinfectant claim, the use dilution test, which utilizes little stainless steel penny cylinders. Then you have the sporicidal activity test. Uh, that test involves 720 porcelain penny cylinders and silk suture loops, and it's done with aerobic spores, so bacillus subtilis and anaerobic spores, so Clostridium sporogenes, and you have to show complete kill on all those tests, so it's a pass-fail test. <clears throat> and then you have other claims, such as germicidal spray claims with disinfectants you can get, which is a 30-second uh, claim, very short time period. But all these claims are related to the manufacturer testing. So they're not something we would recommend in pharma, biotech, or med device. Uh, in the industry, though, in the U.S., Puerto Rico, and other uh, parts of the globe, a lot of facilities, when they do validation, which is what we're going to be talking about here, uh, with these products and the um, <clears throat> testing with them, they'll follow ASTM test methods. The one most commonly used in our industry is called the QCT2, Quantitative Carrier Test Method, and that method number is E2197-17. That's what's utilized a lot in our industry by the contract labs. In fact, we have a contract lab that uses exactly that method. That's done with little stainless steel penny cylinders, and the method actually calls for using one centimeter uh, size carriers uh, and you can even use uh, two centimeter carriers with the method but it's very small coupons that are used in this method there's also a glass uh, surface carrier test method and that's e2111-11 and i believe these methods were pioneered by a gentleman from canada named syed sitar uh, so that's an important you know historical perspective there are also a couple methods out there for virucidal testing so one of the most um, important ones would be the coupon method, which is E1053, and that is used a lot in, a, in the industry as a coupon uh, test method for enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. And my colleague Dan was involved here, or is involved rather, with the standard method for clean room disinfectants here. The Europeans have their own test methodologies. They were all supposed to harmonize a few years ago to the EN norms. So the EN testing, uh, there's a number of suspension or time kill studies here, but then there is the new updated uh, carrier or coupon method, which is EN 13697. So a couple things new with that in 2019. Uh, one is that you have to have for the uh, testing of Aspergillus fungal spores, 75% or greater uh, spiny spores for the testing, which is the mature phase of the, of the spore that you would include in that test. So that's one key thing. Uh, another key thing is when uh, using a soil load with the, with the um, disinfectant part of the testing, uh, with the vegetative organisms, uh, no longer is skim milk in there. Now you're actually using a serum soil load in there. So you can get better test data with organisms like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, in the past, that skim milk made it nearly impossible uh, to pass the testing. So that's, that's a good thing to know. Uh, there is also a virucidal uh, coupon method. That's uh, EN16777. That's out there. 
There's a white method, but there are some issues with the white method. I'll mention those in a minute. Uh, there's French methods and German methods, but the French and the Germans were, are all supposed to harmonize with the EN methodologies. And if you go to Australia, they have their own test methods there, and they are called the TGA methods. So going back to that uh, white method that's used in Europe, uh, that method is EN16615. Uh, and I know that they are working to update that method and uh, provide some new updates to the method. It uses a big stone in the method where you put the wipe below the stone and you wipe the surface with it. Uh, the problem with it is you can even get passing data with water. So it's not a very repeatable, effective method and you can get very different results. So if you had Uday, Richard, Dan, and myself all do the wipe study, you could get four different results with that wipe study. And that's not a good thing, really. So one of the big methods out there that's util utilized a lot in our industry is the European coupon method, and that is the EN13697. So as you can see here, it uses the little uh, two centimeter coupon in the testing. You would inoculate it, and then the inoculated side goes face down in this uh, plastic container. And you see we have glass beads on the bottom of the container. So the recovery step for the method is actually you put it glass bead side face down after you have inoculated it with the organism and then added the disinfectant. So in this, uh, in this broth, you would have a neutralizer. Uh, you would put it inoculated side face down, and then you shake the container and the glass beads will hit the two centimeter coupon and knock the microorganisms off for your recovery step. Here's a close up of that method. So here you look at the little coupon. Uh, we've added the 50 microliters of microorganism, then we desiccate or dry it. Then we add 100 microliters of disinfectant solution. And then we will have, going back to the previous slide, that glass bead recovery step with the coupon placed in there face, uh, face down, inoculated side face down. Uh, the U.S. method, it's also very common in the industry. Uh, that's ASTME 2197-17. We use the little one centimeter coupon here. We add 10 microliters of microorganism. We dry it and desiccate it on there. Uh, then we add 50 microliters of disinfectant solution. And then we have a recovery step with uh, where we have vortexing and sonication. And then we will do plating and enumeration for the recovery step. So one of the big debates we have out there in the industry today is on coupons and specifically coupon size. So we have had some FDA regulators in the US that have mentioned, well, we'd like to see the two inch by two inch coupons, which are huge coupons. They are not easy at all to work with. So 1072, it does not really provide specific guidance on the recovery from the coupons. And basically, when you look at this, you have to have a coupon that you can recover from it. So the smaller coupons, one centimeter, two centimeter, are much, much easier to work with. And that's why you see so many contract labs, including ours, which is AST Labs, utilizing uh, these very small coupons uh, that can be easy to recover from. So the larger coupons, one of the big negative things with that is that very large coupon, coupon negatively infect, uh, affects recovery from it. So that's an issue out there. Uh, and when we talk about the volume of inoculum versus the test product used uh, in a prescriptive reference method, it obviates the need to really have to use these very large two inch by two inch coupons. So we never recommend the big coupons. And if you have to use stomacher bags with those big coupons, that's something really used in the food industry, and it just does not work well with these big uh, coupons. It's just not a good thing. So when I did speak to Tony Kendall, he and I are good friends. We're on the PDA's uh, COVID-19 task force. Uh, one of the things he did tell me is when he co-authored that method with Scott Sutton and Jim Gallico, that uh, specifically regarding that, uh, that methodology mentioned in 1072, he meant that uh, method to be a white method, but no one in the, in the industry utilizes 1072 as a white method. 
we always refer to it as a coupon test method, even when we're talking about the log reduction numbers in it. So here's the problem with the method. I use the two inch by two inch, I inoculate it, and then it dries. You would need a black light to try and find out where exactly I inoculated that huge coupon. We even have some sites even using much larger coupons than this. So that's where the coupon size debate comes into play. 1070 Sioux mentions two inch by two inch, which is 5.08 centimeters by 5.08. As you can see, there are these huge coupons, not easy at all to use in a plastic container, Petri dish, or anything. PDA's Tech Report 70 calls for 3.8 by 3.8 centimeters. That's also fairly large. But what I do recommend is looking at the ASTM E2197 or the EN13697, which call for one centimeter and two centimeter coupon disc, respectively. And you can cut coupons of representative surfaces from your clean room down to a much smaller size to utilize in that test. We have some end users in Europe, uh, one of which uses a 28 by 28 centimeter coupon, nearly impossible to work with, and five by five centimeter coupons, which are almost as big as what it says in 1072, also pretty much impossible to work with. So the larger coupons really limit recovery because you can't do sonication or vortexing. You can't put it inside a, a plastic container uh, with the glass beads. It's just too big to work with. So it's really important to have a scientifically sound repeatable method versus arbitrary size of the coupon. That's a key thing. And so talking a little bit about the coupons used in the industry, so manufacturers of disinfectants with the ASTM and the uh, AOAC methods were required to use uh, specific types of coupons. So many times it'll be stainless steel penny cylinders, silk suture loops, watch glasses, porcelain penny cylinders for the sporocidal challenge test. So we are required to use uh, specific types of coupons for our testing. However, in the industry, what is typically done is you do a very thorough and deep dive risk assessment where you look at the surfaces in the clean room and you will determine between what surfaces occur the most frequently versus what's maybe worst case surface, uh, meaning that it's more, uh, let's say, uh, it's a rougher surface or if the surface is closer proximity to where operators are working in the room or to sterile production. Those are some of the criteria uh, that you would feed into your risk assessment. So some of the examples of surfaces you might include would be different grades of stainless steel. 304 and 306 are typically worst case. Uh, various plastics and elastomers, Lexan, very common with curtains in the clean room. Uh, Kydex, which is a thermal plastic, uh, body coat aluminum, epoxy, polymeric, MMA, or vinyl flooring. Uh, maybe even terrazzo flooring. So the flooring is going to be whatever is common in the clean room area. So if I only have a very small segment of floor that's vinyl, probably not going to include it. But if most, most of my flooring is epoxy from Stonehard, I'd probably reach out to uh, Stonehard to get samples of that flooring to include in my assay. I've even had facilities look at acrylic and grout. Uh, as potential surfaces, Santaflex, which is a, an epoxy-based Sherman Williams paint. Uh, other types of epoxy or water-based paints or sealants might be included. Uh, gasket materials such as EPDM or Teflon and gloves, so rubber or nitrile gloves, or if you use these products in an isolator, you might have samples of that isolator glove or RABS glove uh, for the coupon study. Neutralization is a key thing to keep in mind. You have to quench the reaction and you have to neutralize that antimicrobial active, so the phenol or the quat molecule, to stop it from acting. So typically we recommend to neutralize the active component. Uh, you can neutralize alcohols with the 1 to 100 dilution with water, so neutralize IPA or ethanol. Another effective way is to do filtration with rinsing to separate the active from the organism. And keep in mind that you want to make sure that you're not actually killing the host cells. So some neutralizers like thioglycolate, thiosulfate, which is used with bleach, uh, sodium sulfite, 
Some of these can be toxic to the cell. You want to make sure whatever neutralizer you're using is not actually killing the cells. And when you do your risk assessments and your gap analysis for microorganisms in the clean room, you should be looking for organisms that are broad spectrum, uh, maybe one mold, one gram positive or two gram positives, a gram negative, uh, maybe a yeast if you have it, and a bacterial spore. Whatever occurs most frequently, so if I only see one mold hit a year of a certain type of mold, you might not want to include it. If it occurs at high levels in the clean room, you would want to include it. If it appears to be worst case, I would probably include that as well. And then when we talk about additional reference strain testing, many times the manufacturer, like our company, will have reference strains available, so reference strain data with different coupon studies. Uh, you can also include some in your study with American type culture strains or USDA strains. This is a very helpful table out there uh, that gives you a good gauge for uh, susceptibility of these different uh, microorganisms to different biocidal agents. So if we look here at the table, uh, organisms like uh, bacterial endospores, and there's kind of a hierarchy within the spores that show which ones are gonna be uh, most difficult to kill, such as Bacillus cereus, Bacillus viricus, and Penne bacillus, versus much easier to kill like Bacillus subtilis, uh, Bacillus pumilus, Bacillus terephomophilus, and even your anaerobic spores, which are even easier to kill, like Clostridium. Uh, so that's important. So your sporocytes can kill from bacterial spores all the way down the spectrum. Your quats will be able to kill from fungal spores like Aspergillus and Penicillium on down the spectrum. And your uh, phenolic disinfectants can kill from Mycobacterium, which is TB, on down the spectrum and alcohols will be able to kill uh, actually maybe even up to TB on down the spectrum. And I will say that envelope viruses such as HIV-1, herpes, hepatitis, SARS-CoV-2, which is coronavirus, these are extremely easy to kill and even 60% alcohols can kill them. So keep that in mind. USP or USP, EPA in the US, so Environmental Protection Agency, they have uh, what's called the end list on the internet and under the end list, they list a whole uh, plethora of different disinfectants, uh, sporicides that can be used to kill uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then when we talk about gram-positive cocci, uh, like Staph, Micrococcus, Streptococcus, these are the most common organisms in the clean room because of people. Uh, pretty much all of your disinfectants, sporicides, and sanitizers will kill them. So a couple things I want to mention here, there's been an ongoing debate for about 10 years in the industry now for the pros and cons of not testing. So one of the things you have to uh, think of when we talk about the reason for not testing is it does uh, take a big cost. So whenever you have to delegate uh, testing and resources in a contract lab or even internally to doing a coupon study, uh, that is a pretty high cost. So there is a, an interest in the industry to get rid of that and not have to do it with all organisms or any. Uh, and so one of the things they have uh, looked at and that we have looked at in the industry uh, is having one big centralized coupon study and being able to reference it. Well, that really never got done in the industry, but a couple of years, well, about a year ago, uh, the BPAW group uh, put a very nice PDA article together uh, referencing how to conduct a global coupon test study. Uh, if you don't have a copy of it, I'd be happy to share it with Uday, but it's a very nicely written document, but it's not uh, in any way, shape, or form a centralized coupon study. Uh, then there's been some interest with the Product Quality and Research Institute, which does a lot of work for the FDA. Uh, and one of the things that they've looked at from an industry's perspective there was to have all of the industry referencing manufacturer's data from different disinfectant companies uh, versus so the EPA data, the EN test data versus having all the different pharma, biotech, med device companies go out and reproduce, uh, you know, that kind of data with coupon studies. Uh, that also has not gone, gone very far from what I understand. So one of the reasons that I think it's important to do this testing in the industry is when we look at organisms such as your Bacillus cereus, 
and even some of the molds like cotomium. Uh, so what we've learned is some of these bacillus, some of these molds, so bacillus cereus for bacterial spores, uh, we even have some like uh, penne bacillus, uh, and then for mold spores like cotomium, some do not conform to what you see generally in the industry with the ability to just uh, refer to one centralized study, uh, meaning that some of these are more difficult to kill. So it's not that they're necessarily resistant, but that maybe in the case of Bacillus cereus, it has a thicker exospore sugar coat around it, making it more difficult to penetrate. And certain mold spores like uh, cotomium are just inherently dip more difficult to kill. So those are things to that, in my opinion, would necessitate the need to do the coupon studies and for sure to do the field trials. In terms of log reduction, there's some good suggestions on this slide. For suspension or time kill studies, it's really Ill, easy to kill organisms that are surrounded 360 degrees by a biocidal agent. So you should be able to easily get a four to five log reduction against them. Uh, USP 1072 talks about a two log reduction of bacterial endospores, three log reduction of vegetative bacteria. Again, I think those are very easily attainable. One of the things Tony is planning to update with the 1072 chapter, as you can see here, fungal spores and yeast are not included, but a lot of folks in the industry refer to fungal spores and yeast with the two log reduction. PDA's Tech Report 70, and this may get updated because it's supposed to re be reviewed soon, talks about a one to five minute contact time with disinfectants and sporicides and having a greater than one log reduction. Uh, and it talks about a 90 second uh, contact time with alcohols as sanitizers and getting a one log reduction there. Uh, this is a very nice table from PDA's Tech Report 70 uh, that spells out what the different organisms are, uh, what the antimicrobial agent is, so sanitizer, disinfectant, sporicide and gives you an idea of what the contact time could be. So 90 seconds and one to five minutes and what your level of log reduction could be and it all states greater than one log. Uh, that's what you may actually see changing when it gets uh, audited and reviewed. It's very critical and important in the industry to actually do some testing with the products you're using because as you can see here, uh, we did some testing with different biocides at a pharma company and what we find is the hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistry performs uh, pretty much the best in all these circumstances against uh, molds such as the very hard to kill uh, Aspergillus brasiliensis spores. And down here, if you look at it against Bacillus subtilis bacterial spores, it does really well. Bleach, so 5,250 uh, ppm of available chlorine in bleach uh, does very well as well against uh, fungal and bacterial spores. However, it's important to do testing because one of the things we see both with 6% hydrogen peroxide and also with 3% is from a fungicidal perspective and a bacterial spore uh, perspective, we don't see really great efficacy. So you may take it may take you an hour or more to get the contact time uh, level of kill uh, against the spores. And that's really an important thing to keep in mind because what we see then is companies do the testing and they're always surprised by that. That's why you need to actually test it. So now I'm turning the uh, table over to Dan Klein and Dan will take over from here. All right, I'll give Jim a break. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the testing challenges related to the microbiology coupon studies. Um, so I've managed testing laboratories for about 20 years. And, and one thing that I've learned for sure is that hard surface microbiology testing is very challenging. Uh, it's very technique sensitive. You're working with millions of living microorganisms on a surface um, and they're very labor intensive. It takes a lot of, of, of work to get these studies done and a lot can go wrong. So next slide, Jim. So what I wanna do is to help Avoid adverse data. How do we how do we do this testing and avoid getting unexpected results? That's going to necessitate expensive repeats or more time, more money, that sort of thing. And what we've done is split them up into five general categories that can cause these adverse results. 
or are failures in your efficacy testing and your efficacy micro coupon studies. Uh, we have the general causes of failure, uh, neutralization issues, which Jim alluded to earlier, uh, inoculum problems, uh, problems with the different surfaces, uh, preparing the surface and testing different surfaces, and then recovery of the microorganism off of the surface. So starting into the general uh, category, and this is just basically sometimes your disinfectant just isn't effective. Uh, it's, you know, the testing's done fine, but maybe you're using the wrong dilution. Instead of using a 1 to 128, it's prepared at, at 1 to 64 or, or 1 to 256 for a concentrate, for example. You just have the, the wrong dilution of, of your active that can cause you to fail the study. Another, as Jim alluded to, is, is using the wrong methods. Um, AOAC methods are used, as mentioned, for registration of disinfectants with the US EPA. They're very good methods in that they've been around since the 1940s. I mean, they're, they've been around for 80 years and there's a lot of data behind them, but they're qualitative. You either pass or you fail. You either have growth or no growth. It doesn't tell you any useful data for evaluating whether or not you can get a log reduction that is needed in a critical environment. Uh, testing an ineffective chemistry. Um, alcohols are not gonna be effective against spores. You looked at the hierarchy of susceptibility earlier. Um, and if you're testing spores against a clot or an alcohol product, you're not gonna expect to see activity. Uh, typically labs will store alcohol or store spores in alcohol solutions uh, for use in studies. So you're certainly not gonna get the kill there. So if you do that testing and, and you're testing alcohol and say, well, I'm gonna go ahead and include some bacillus species in this test, you're really just wasting time and money because it's not going to work. Uh, and then finally, another general cause of failure is just choosing the wrong contact time. Um, you want to try to get aggressive on your contact time. And you're not giving the active ingredient enough time to work. So those are some general common things to think about as you're designing these studies uh, and conducting these studies to make sure you avoid. The next one's neutralization. And, and we bring this up because it consistently is a challenge for people doing testing um, is understanding neutralization. And neutralization, as mentioned, is, is very simple. It's just stopping chemically or physically the activity of the disinfectant at the exact time that you want to evaluate. So if you want to do a 10 minute contact time, you want to stop the activity exactly at 10 minutes, either chemically, so add a chemical neutralizer that's going to inactivate your active, so something that's going to inactivate your quat or your spore side or your phenolic, or physically by filtering out the active ingredient and stopping the reaction that way. But it's important to stop that reaction exactly at that contact time, or you're gonna have continued activity going on that's gonna give you misleading results. And sometimes it's very hard to see that you have a neutralizer problem. Sometimes you can look on the plate and you can say, okay, I, I have my 10 to the zero, my 10 to the one, my 10 to the two, 10 to the minus two are non-dilutional. So it took additional dilution to get that neutralization. Or sometimes you can see the microorganisms are are unevenly spread. There's a big zone of clearing where there's some active still left, but a lot of times you don't see it and you don't know that you had a neutralization problem. So you didn't neutralize your chemistry. You got this great activity, you're all excited, um, only to find out that that's because the, the active ingredient kept working after the time it was supposed to be stopped. So a really good method for that evaluation is the ASTM 1054 evaluation of inactivators method, uh, which has a lot of work put into it to really evaluate the effectiveness of a neutralizer, uh, both for its ability to stop that reaction, but also any potential toxicity that could be present in the neutralizer. Uh, as, as Jim mentioned, you don't want your neutralizer itself to be harmful to the microorganisms being tested. So you wanna make sure that it's non-toxic and still works. So there are a lot of good references out there on different neutralizers. This is from PDA Tech Report 70 which gives some guidance on where to start with neutralizers. But one thing I wanna point out, I think that's very important here, is a formulation is typically more than just the active ingredient. If, you're, if, if a company is developing a disinfectant formulation, they're gonna include you know, keelants and surfactants and, and different things that also have to be considered. So it's not just active in water typically, uh, maybe in the case of alcohol or sodium hypochlorite, that, that may be the case, but, but most disinfectants are, are much more complicated. So this is a really good tool uh, to use to look at something like this to start to establish what your neutralizer should be, but it's not the end-all be-all uh, for selection. And again, you want to make sure that you're not getting any toxicity, that you're not, well, we're just going to put a bunch of sodium thiosulfate in there, 
or we're going to put a bunch of catalase in there. You know, catalase is great for inactivating hydrogen peroxide enzymatically, but if you put too much catalase in there and you have a reservoir of catalase left over, for example, then you could have actually a negative impact in toxicity from your neutralizer. The next slide shows some more uh, different chemical neutralizers as they relate to different biocide classes for from hydrogen peroxide to the quats and phenolics, uh, as well as the sodium hypochlorites, um, free iodine, things like that. Next slide, please. So the next common cause of failure is issues with the inoculum. Um, and this is something that's that we continue to learn about. Um, during some of the work with the AOAC sporocidal method, there's a lot of evaluations into inoculum preparation and what impact the media has on the susceptibility of the spores. So if there's high levels of manganese sulfate, for example, that are uptaken into the spore, it can actually cause a, a different resistance profile than if it's grown on TSA or some other media. Uh, so you can have two cultures that are grown very, very similarly, but with different medias that can have different results. So you have to be thinking about your inoculum, making sure that you're growing it on the right media and that you're growing it for the right amount of time. You wanna make sure your bacteria, for example, is in the right phase of growth. You don't wanna incubate too long so it starts to go into a death phase. Uh, you wanna make sure it's at that log phase somewhere you know, 18 to 24 hours of growth. You wanna look at your clumping of your inoculum uh, when you're preparing your inoculum. Some microorganisms clump together and you don't wanna test a, a biofilm or a big mat of spores or a big mat of fungi that you can't get access to with your disinfectant. For fungal species are really just one of the main uh, challenges in testing because you have these complicated multicellular eukaryotic species. They have branching elements and hyphal elements and then they have the conidiospores and you really want to test that conidiospore. You want to remove that extra material so you're testing what you want to evaluate to see if you're able to kill it. And you want to watch your titers, make sure you have adequate challenge. Uh, some microorganisms are very sensitive to drying. So a pseudomonas that's used to a wet watery environment, for example, or even a candida yeast does not like to be dried on a hard surface. So you may start with a good challenge, but after that drying process, you might end up with too low of a challenge to evaluate in your study. And then of course, you wanna make sure that you have a good clean culture that's not contaminated, that you don't have something else in there and that you're testing what you're looking for. So looking at that a little bit more on the next slide, talking about the fungi, you know, you can see here, the Anaspergillus uh, culture. And if you look closely at the kind of the white hairs at the top there, the, you can see some actual spores coming off of that fungi. Um, the fungi, again, are gonna be eukaryotic, multicellular. So you're gonna have these branching elements as they grow and you really wanna isolate and test those conidia, those conidiospores. That's really the, the, the part of the challenge you wanna look at. And then on the next slide, you can also see that you wanna make sure you're testing the right phase of growth. Um, Jim talked about the, the EN 13697 requirements for 75% spiny spores. And I think these are just great uh, uh, SEM images that show exactly that, that, that show that mature phase of the fungal spore and show how important it is to have these spiny spores. Um, when the requirement is at least 75% of the population microscopically to make sure that you have the right level of challenge, that you don't have immature fungal spores that maybe are too easy to kill. Uh, and aren't representative of what is going to be the issue potentially uh, for spreading in an environment. Uh, next slide. So talking more about some common causes of failures, I want to get into uh, the surfaces uh, because surface type and surface condition obviously can have a huge impact on efficacy and on your experimental outcomes. Uh, when you're doing a time kill study, where you do have that 360 degrees, you don't have a surface, so it's not a concern. You're just putting microorganism into disinfectant and testing it in your tube. But for real value, you need to incorporate your hard surface. So you need to make sure your surfaces are right. You have to make sure that they can be sterilized. So there is no contamination on your surface. And autoclaving may not be acceptable for some surfaces. Some surfaces will not function well after the heat and pressure of an autoclave cycle. You wanna make sure there's no uh, residues on that surface that could interact either with your microorganism or, or with your disinfectant and have some kind of adverse result there. And you wanna make sure there's no rusting or pitting. Um, obviously, 
bacteria are very small. So, so small pits in your surface can harbor and hide those microorganisms and prevent you from getting exposure to disinfectant and prevent you then from truly testing your disinfectant. Um, and there's some surfaces that can, can cause a real issue, surfaces that peel or surfaces that have different surface tension that can have impact on your disinfectant contacting your microorganism. And we'll show you some of those next. We can go to the next slide. This is a, a, a really great image um, talking about preparation of coupons and how not all coupons can be sterilized in an autoclave. So you can see this uh, gypsum board with paint that was autoclaved to sterilize it and started to peel off, started to separate. So you're not gonna be able to test that coupon. You're gonna have to look at some alternate way to sterilize it. Uh, maybe use of a spore side followed by an IPA rinse, for example, uh, to make sure that that surface is sterile for testing because if you autoclave it, you're gonna ruin the surface. Next slide. This is an example of the surface tension issue where you have droplets forming or beading uh, occurring where you're not getting good uniform spread. So you're not getting good disinfectant contact with your microorganism. So you have to make sure you evaluate those surfaces for the potential of, of this kind of surface tension issue, this kind of beading, this kind of lack of contact. Next slide. And this is a good one too, showing just an impact of sterilization that may not be as obvious when you pull it out of the autoclave, uh, but you can see how it's bowed when you put it on the surface. Well, if you try to inoculate that, it's gonna run down both sides. You're not gonna keep your inoculum where you need it. And that's where the, the having the blue light looking for it is gonna come into play again, because you're not gonna know where the inoculum is so you can make sure you apply the disinfectant. And then you apply the disinfectant, and again, you're gonna have it running because you don't have a flat surface. So another example of a sterilization issue. Next slide. And here's one that comes out of the um, of the autoclave or, or comes out of, of the preparation where the texture of the surface actually changes uh, through the cutting and sterilization process. So the surface ends up getting this this these these peaks and valleys that aren't representative of what the texture truly is. So you obviously don't want to test something that has that level of topography, that level of, of peaks and valleys, because your inoculum and disinfectant are not going to be well dispersed and they're not going to have good contact and you're not going to get good results and you're going to have to spend time and money to repeat this type of study. Next slide. And then here's one that shows that some things that are very well intact, maybe in a wall or well intact in a floor, when you do create coupons, uh, they can fall apart. And you can see here that once this coupon here was cut, you lost the integrity of the coupon. You don't, you no longer have a true intact surface to test. Instead, it's degraded to the point that it's gonna be very hard to use in the study. So surfaces are key. Next slide, Jim. And then finally, this one just talks a little bit about some of the challenges in surface testing relative to the topography of the surface, to the, the, the smoothness of the surface. And you have to be very conscious of the surface grit, the surface finish, what that surface looks like in terms of its smoothness and its roughness, and make sure you have something that is representative uh, because that can create some real challenges when it comes to testing. Again, because you're trying to get contact with the dried microorganism and your disinfectant. Next slide. So kind of moving on to the, the next issue after talking about the general challenges, some of the neutralization issues that always come up, making sure you have that right inoculum grown the right way for the right amount of time, as well as some of these surface challenges. I uh, want to talk a little about recovery. Um, there are multiple ways to recover microorganisms off a of surface, but of course this is going to be critical. You're going to have to know how many CFUs are alive, how many microorganisms survive, so you can calculate log reduction, so you can figure out what your, your data looks like and figure out the effectiveness of your disinfectant. Um, so you have to be able to have a good recovery method. And this comes back to some of the challenges with using larger coupons. If you're using a larger coupon, you're kind of limited in how you recover the microorganism. You're looking at some kind of swab technique, perhaps, which can be hard to get all the microorganisms off the surface, or even a contact plate where you're actually just pressing on there which is rarely used because you're gonna have some issues with getting good transfer. 
one of the best obvious things to do is to take your coupon, and this would require the smaller coupons, and place that into the neutralization media directly, and then using sonication, vortexing, even the glass beads that, that were shown earlier, to make sure that you're getting really good recovery off of that surface. So you can get those log reduction values, so you can really calculate the effectiveness of your disinfection. And you have to make sure that that recovery method works and that's been validated and verified to, to be shown effective for the surface that you're using. Next slide. So kind of to wrap things up, um, again, micro, uh, microbiological coupon testing can be, can be very complicated, can be very labor intensive, and there can be a lot of challenges that you need to think about up, head, up, up front. So upfront proactive planning is extremely important. Uh, as mentioned earlier, selecting the right methods. Uh, AOC methods are great methods, but they're not good for this application. Uh, they're qualitative, it's growth or no growth. Uh, you don't actually get a log reduction value truly with that method. Um, you can still utilize that method to look at things for inoculum prep, spore prep. It's good to understand the methodology, but that's not the right choice for a, a validation type study. It's a, a supplier requirement often that's used. Better, you're much better off looking at the methods that were designed for hard surface testing. The EN13697 hard surface method, for example, or the ASTM2197 uh, quantitative carrier test were designed to be hard surface tests, designed to give you quantitative log reduction values and are much better fits for this type of testing. Uh, Jim talked a little bit about log reductions and looking at some, some of the different references for establishing your correct log reduction pass-fail criteria. Again, that upfront planning um, is extremely important for these studies because they are, like I said, kind of it can be time consuming and very expensive. Um, combining physical removal and chemical kill can often complicate a study in an unnecessary manner. So by that, it's sometimes best to inoculate your coupon and then directly apply your disinfectant with a pipette to make sure that you're evaluating the activity of your disinfectant, that you're not bringing in you know, mop fibers or wiping techniques or some other uh, product application technique that is just going to maybe A, overestimate your results because you have that physical removal going in there, and then B, just complicate your study. You're no longer just looking at your disinfectant activity, you're looking at your activity of your mop and, and your disinfectant and how much pressure goes in and who's doing it and whether they're pushing really hard or not and things like that. You have to make sure that uh, you understand your, your product, understand your limitations, that you're testing the right product against the right microorganisms, that you're not testing alcohol against spores, for example. Uh, you want to make sure that your products are being used correctly. Um, within expiration for you know, dating and, and that everything is, is used in a timely manner. Um, sometimes it's better to, training is, is, is essential in these, in these methods. So it is valuable to use an experienced lab, but even if you're using an experienced contract lab, you still need to make sure that you know exactly what they're doing, that they've been adequately trained, that you're monitoring the protocols and monitoring the data asking the right questions, looking for anything anomalous in your results, and even auditing the contract lab physically or, or virtually uh, to make sure that you're comfortable that they can get you the exact right type of results that you need. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jim, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit about some case studies. Hey, thanks, Dan. Bringing back my camera back online. Uh, so again, it's a pleasure to uh, be here this morning and this afternoon for you guys. Uh, now I want to get into one of the most important aspects of that uh, disinfectant validation program, and that is the case studies, also called the, the field trials. So let's uh, take a deeper dive here. So what some of these coupons, first off, I want to talk a little bit about some of the coupon studies, and then I'm going to get specifically into the field trials. So with the coupon studies, this is some data from three different pharma sites in France. As you can see here on the left-hand side, these are different coupon surfaces they used. And a couple of interesting ones here were hardwood and melamine covered wood. And just as a reference here in clean room settings, you should never have wood in the clean room. It's a very porous material and it's nearly impossible to get 
uh, microbial kill with because organisms hide in different layers of that porous material. So the microorganisms, based on their risk assessment, were listed up here at the top. So staph, pseudomonas, coronae bacterium, the yeast candida albicans, and two fungal spores, so aspergillus and penicillium. And they were using a low pH uh, phenolic disinfectant, so uh, an acidic phenol. And the objective was a three log or greater reduction. And you'll notice here with the vegetative bacteria, they easily hit that number with no problem. However, they had a couple of issues here with some uh, fungal, or this is actually uh, yeast testing, the candida. Uh, that may be artifact. It may just be to the op uh, due to the operator doing the tests, which can happen. Uh, but over here, you see some real issues with the testing with the mold spores. And that is because uh, some of these molds, like aspergillus and penicillium, are harder to kill. And those little spores uh, would require a sporicide to be able to kill them. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. Uh, we also have some a very nice global test data here from a global biotech site. Uh, where they tested a, a whole array of different biocidal products, some of which were supposed to be sporicidal. But one of the key take home points I want to point out here is the objective they were trying to get was a two log reduction and against Aspergillus, uh, which is now called Aspergillus brasiliensis, uh, Bacillus pumilus, and Bacillus subtilis. They only had two products, uh, so the hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistry and the bleach that routinely got sporicidal efficacy. So some of these other ones, some of which were supposed to have efficacy, for example, against molds, did not have it, as you can see. Uh, and then down here against vegetative bacteria, you see some pretty good data overall. Uh, so you know that these types of chemistries are pretty effective uh, when it comes to vegetative non-spore forming bacteria that are all listed here. Uh, we did throw in a yeast there in that testing. Uh, where the objective was a three log or greater reduction. So one of the key things I want to mention here is having an effective antimicrobial agent, as Dan just said, alcohol, um, unbeknownst to the uh, uh, compounding pharmacies, doesn't kill everything. So you need to keep that in mind. It's good as a sanitizer, it can be a disinfectant, but it is definitely not going to kill spores. Uh, you need an effective and repeatable protocol. That's why using those very big two inch by two inch or uh, even larger 25 by 25 centimeter or uh, inch coupons are just not going to be effective. So keep that in mind. The big coupons, not easy to work with, not easy to recover from. You need an effective sanitization procedure that you can actually get field trial data with in the clean room. We'll talk about that. Uh, and if anything changes in your clean room facility, you need to see how that will affect your coupon testing. So for example, a new shift of operators, uh, new flooring is brought in by Stonehard, uh, new wall paneling, um, any type of new material is brought in, you're adding a couple of extra shifts. How does this affect the flora from your environmental monitoring and data trending? Do you see new microbes, new organisms? that you might wanna include in your coupon studies. And a big question I always get when I do these webinars, and I just did one yesterday for PDA New England chapter on a similar topic, is how often do I need to requalify? Well, you should be reviewing that environmental trending data over time and taking a look at that snapshot over let's say a six to 12 month period. And from looking at that data, if you have a new organism popping up that's hard to kill or shows up very frequently, then you may want to include that in your disinfectant coupon study. Let's say you have a new aspergillus or a new penicillium, then I would suggest including that in your testing. And then about every five to seven years, you would want to take a look at your overall uh, disinfectant uh, coupon testing and field trial data. And if you had problems back when you do, do, did and executed your coupon testing, if you had problems with, let's say, your neutralization, your log reduction numbers, or maybe your positive and negative controls, that may be a good time uh, to really think about repeating some of that testing because it's so old. 
So I've worked with a number of large biotech companies that have spent millions of dollars on their disinfecting coupon studies. Uh, and what they did is they looked at some of that five to seven year old data and it really was just not very complete. Uh, and there were little holes at different areas in the testing. So what they did is they spent a lot of money and actually repeated those studies. So now I'm getting into one of the most important and critical topics that you can do, and that is the field trials, the in-situ testing. Uh, this is really important when you look at, for example, uh, what FDA regulators are looking for. So Thomas Arista from FDA, who uh, runs the FDA field office there in India, or you look at John Metcalf from FDA, or Sharon Toma from FDA, or Andy Hopkins, who used to be with MHRA, any of these global regulators will tell you that this kind of data is absolutely critical to showing them really how efficacious and effective overall your cleaning and disinfection and validation program really is. So let's take a snapshot of this. So I published a couple of recent articles out there in American Pharmaceutical Review on this topic. One of, some of the key things that you need to keep in mind are it's best to do this type of testing uh, when you're putting in a new clean room, uh, after a shutdown procedure, construction event, power failure, or any type of worst case event. I put a poll up yesterday during the PDA New England chapter webinar. And when I got to this topic, I asked the audience how many of them uh, have done uh, this type of testing, this field trial data. And I had about 45% of my audience have done this. And they typically do it after a worst case event, like a power failure construction event. That's great. That's a good thing. You want to make sure all your SOPs are up to date, your procedures are up to date. It talks about the right type of dilution, whether or not the product needs to be sterile. Uh, and you want to evaluate these worst case conditions. So the objective is you'll have a time zero point, let's say post-construction where the facility is very dirty and you do have a lot of bio burden in the clean room. Uh, then, for example, you can bring in a low pH phenolic, clean area, uh, clean that clean room area. Then you take a T1 data reading uh, with active air sampling, subtle plates, uh, swabbing, and uh, RODAC plates, and you want to show what the bio burden is in that area. Uh, then you would apply, uh, for example, the high pH phenolic next. So let's say uh, you have a high pH phenol, you would apply it with mops and wipers in the clean room. Then you take a T2 time point and take a look at that environmental monitoring data in the clean room. And you want to show a reduction in that bio burden. And finally, you come in with your nuclear weapon, the sporicide. So it would be like spore cleanse, bleach, some type of sporicidal agent, BHP and you wanna show an overall very large reduction at the end, and then collect that T3 time point data to show a really robust decline in bio burden in the clean room. That's what we call triple clean data, and that is an in situ field trial. Regulators love to see it. So now I'm gonna walk you through some examples. One of the first things I wanna let you know is in the industry, there's not really a unified definition of what a field trial is. So you could go to 10 different sites in India and get 10 different, slightly different responses. But PDA's Tech Report 70, it does actually state in there a pretty nice definition where it says facilities should strongly consider having special startup cleaning and disinfection programs in place following shutdowns or when uh, significant construction has been performed. And then it talks about doing a cleaning event with two times with disinfectant, followed by the sporicide. Some sites may use a disinfectant three times, then bring in the sporicide. So this is a nice schematic of a facility with a lot of contamination post-construction. As you can see here in the upper right-hand corner, we have a lot of bacteria in the rooms. We have a lot of fungi a lot of yeast included there, and a lot of spores, bacterial spores. So the facility, as you can see here, is very dirty post-construction, lots of bio burden. We come in and we're gonna start the triple clean. We clean the area from most critical zone, so where we have BSC or RABS, uh, and you work your way out of the room. You never go from the gowning room into the sterile zone. You always start at that 
very critical zone and work your way out. And then you'll be applying disinfectant in that room. So what we'll do is we'll apply the next generation quat technology, so quaternary ammonium disinfectant, two times. You'll take environmental monitoring data after each phase. And what you can see here in the clean room, we have gotten rid of all our vegetative bacteria and our molds. So that next generation disinfectant, great job. Now we come in with the sporicidal agent and we nuke the place. And that hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistry does a fantastic job coming in and killing all that bio burden and all those spores that we had left behind in the rooms. So some fantastic data here. Uh, that would be best case scenario, what we'd like to see uh, from our triple cleaning event and our field trial. So there are different options for doing the field trial. You wanna do it obviously always after a worst case event. One of my colleagues in the industry, Anne-Marie Dixon, who's an independent consultant, she recommends a lot of times to do a 9X clean. That's for example, doing a triple clean three times in the clean room and taking uh, EM data uh, either at beginning at the beginning or at the and at the end or after each phase. You could also do a cleaning with a disinfectant and then a fogging event with a hydrogen peroxide uh, parasitic acid chemistry. You could clean with disinfectant and apply VHP, but the most economical application would be a triple cleaning. And so now I'm going to go through a case study where a uh, big pharmacite Genentech used a disinfectant three times and then brought in a sporicidal agent. So this is the grid, the roadmap, so to speak, of my clean room uh, with all the different grid boxes. And what we have done is we take environmental monitoring. So Carol from Genentech went in. Uh, the red represents all of the spores in the clean room, so fungal and bacterial. Green represents all the vegetative bacteria, mainly brought in by my operators in the room. And as you can see, after one cleaning with the low pH phenol, we have removed and killed all the vegetative bio burden in the room. Some very good data coming out. Then we will come in and we clean with the alkaline pH uh, phenol. And you can see here, we again, removing and killing a lot of the bio burden. Then we come in one more time with the low pH phenolic, and again, we have removed a lot of the spores in the room because keep in mind, disinfectants both clean and disinfect. That's phenols and quats both do that. So then we come in with the final step and we're going to kill off these Bacillus cereus spores with the sporicide. So the hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistry comes in and voila, we have killed all the spores in the clean room. We have very good data here. So to summarize what myself and my colleague, Dan Klein, talked to you about today in the webinar, we talked about efficacy testing methodologies and requirements in the industry. I talked a little bit about what the FDA and European regulators expect, as well as regulations and guidance documents in the industry. I talked about testing, or my colleague, Dan, talked about testing challenges and did a very nice deep dive into what all those challenges may be and how to overcome some of them. Uh, I talked about some of the case studies at different pharma sites and biotech sites. And then finally, I finished off with field trials and how to conduct those. Uh, I have a couple of very good studies uh, that were published in American Pharmaceutical Review, one with phenols and one with quats that we'd be happy to share with you and with Uday. And that is a list of all the references from today. Any of the ones that are not copyrighted, Dan or myself can share with you. Uh, the other ones, uh, we would be happy to provide you a website link from uh, Google so you can purchase it or access it. And we wanna give special thanks to these folks from our St. Louis facility uh, that assisted, assisted with the scan electron microscopy and other efficacy testing data and pictures. And that is all I have today, Uday. Uh, I know you have our contact information. And uh, with all that being said, uh, we are happy uh, to take any questions. Thank you. And there are several questions and we can we can go through that. Uh, 
uh, okay now this is a question about sampling compressed air is there any requirement of sampling uh, compressed air for monitoring I think in the industry that is typically done uh, periodically. So periodically I do see compressed air like, uh, for example, nitrogen, argon, helium being tested. Uh, and sometimes it does come up hot or positive. So uh, you just need to keep that into consideration. So I would look, uh, I think USP may have some guidance on that. Dan, did you want to comment on that? I think that's right, Jim, because they can show a bio burden occasionally. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question about size and shape of coupons. And like you explained, you know, different guidances are having different sizes and different shapes. Uh, would you be able to comment which is the most acceptable one or which is the most used one of the several things which, uh, which you presented? Dan, I think that'd be a good one for you, my yeah. friend. I think we all. I think the the most commonly used and the best to use would be a two centimeter by two centimeter coupon. Um, the two inch by two inch really is a little too large to do good laboratory studies on. Um, the two centimeter by two centimeter gives you a, a nice surface area for inoculation and it's still small enough for good recovery. So that's that's typically what what um, a lot of the contract labs that I've worked with would recommend. And uh, do you see, uh, is the next part of this question, any harmonization in these things in the near future, in a year or two? That, that is a uh, that's a wonderful question um, because those activities have been going on for a while. So there was an OECD group formed about 2001 maybe to look at some global harmonization efforts uh, for disinfectant testing in general as it relates to coupon methods uh, using the QCT model, the quantitative carrier test method that's also the ASTM method that was developed at the University of Ottawa by Dr. Syed Sitar. And this group has been trying with American representation, European and international representation to really come up with some harmonization. They're still working on it. It's been 20 years, so I'm not holding my breath, but it's certainly there's certainly a need for it. And, and something that's a, a great uh, a, a great endeavor, but it's it, we're we're not there yet. And Uday and they outlived my grandma, who's 93 years old. <laughs> and that, that's the thing with so many other things where harmonization is not there. Uh, coupons are just uh, just one of them. Uh, now you know nowadays we talk a lot about science based uh, reasoning and you know science behind doing anything. So can you give what is the scientific justification for any of the coupon recommendation? Is there any science behind you know, whether you talk of two, two, two centimeter by two centimeter, one centimeter by one centimeter, or a one centimeter disc or a two centimeter disc? Is there any science behind the size? Why don't I give a comment, Dan, and then I'll turn it to you. Because uh, one of the things I just want to mention is I was in Ireland right before the pandemic. And I was at a site in Northern Ireland that was trying to do coupon testing. Uh, and they actually didn't really need to because they were more uh, nutraceutical, but they were trying to do the coupon testing with the big uh, two inch by two inch coupons. And they were using the stomacher bags, Dan's favorite you know, method for recovery there. And uh, running into lots of little issues there with the stomacher bags. And I think that when you start to look at these very large coupons, uh, and that some of the pharma sites in, in uh, Europe use, uh, you run into a lot of problems with that because they're just too hard to work with. And uh, as one of our colleagues, Dave Shields at our contract lab has shown, when you inoculate it with the bug, uh, then trying to find out where on that coupon you inoculated it, you almost need a black light to find it. So uh, with that, I turn over to Dan. He would have a lot of knowledge on that. Because I don't think there is a real good scientific justification in terms of you know, microbial distribution relative to surface size. I think it, it's more like Jim just talked about, it's more uh, a practicality, a practical ease of use, having something that you can look at in an in vitro study that is the 
uh, easiest or, or maybe easier to work with versus some kind of scientific calculation justification for why that size makes sense. Okay. Uh, this is a question about uh, neutralization efficacy. Uh, can growth promotion of media be acceptable instead of neutralizer efficacy? Growth promotion studies are typically just going to show the ability of your media to support the growth of low numbers of microorganisms. There are some growth promotion type neutralizer studies where you take your, your, your disinfectant, you put it in your neutralizer, and then you back inoculate it at the end with a small number of microorganisms. Uh, to show growth and, and therefore assume that your neutralizer is inactivated. So that is a tool that you can use, but it's not going to give you as much data as something like an ASTM 1054 method that really is going to show you that toxicity. It's going to show you quantitatively by bog reduction whether there's any residual activity. Jim, I don't know if you wanted to, to add to that. I think that's really good feedback, and I think that uh, when you start to look at and you do some research into neutralization, uh, you look at books like Hugo, Alif, Denver Russell have written, and what you see is there's some really good chemical neutralizers out there uh, that you can easily use uh, for neutralization in your DE studies. One of them is Day and Engle neutralizer, uh, but I would highly suggest referencing them because there's been a lot of work with the neutralizers and the different disinfecting agents, and there's a lot of nice tables out there that give you some feedback on, you know, what type of neutralizer to use. I know, uh, Dan, I'm looking at a paper here. One of the neutralizers we use a lot uh, in-house for phenols and quats is called LAT broth, which is simply lethane broth plus lecithin plus uh, tween 80, and that works really well for phenols and quats. So I would suggest looking at some of the reference material uh, that's been written out there by Russell, Hugo, and Alif. Uh, and I think, you know, some great stuff out there. The Block Book is a great resource on that. You co-authored a, or you authored a chapter in the Block Book, so you, you know about that too. Yeah, it's a great point, Jim. I mean, because there is a lot of literature available because a lot of research has gone into some of the neutralizer development. Some of this started, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago with some of the hand hygiene products working with triclosan. And triclosan is a bisphenol ring, so it's very stable and very hard to chemically inactivate. So that was when, as Jim mentioned, uh, we developed a, a lethane-based neutralizer that also included purified lecithin and tween uh, to, to, get, uh, dis uh, to get neutralization of some of the phenolic actives. So, yeah, definitely, definitely go to, to the literature to look for some of these things. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is, if a disinfectant has been demonstrated to be effective against bacterial spores, can that be leveraged to replace the need for a coupon study against viruses? Or does that depend on risk assessment? For example, BSL-2 versus BSL-3 viruses, bulk manufacturing, starting material control, etc. Let me take a stab at this one. So uh, I would think for the most part, and Dan, you can comment on this, but disinfectants will not show very good activity against bacterial spores. Uh, so anytime you're testing a disinfectant, a phenol or quad against, say, B. serious, Bacillus subtilis, you're not going to see very good effectiveness. Uh, if you are testing fungal spores, you may see, you may be able to get that two log reduction. Uh, but it may not necessarily be the best chemistry to use against some, uh, some of those hard-to-kill fungal spores like cotillium. So one of the things I would say is uh, you would also want to do a risk analysis or risk assessment uh, if you're looking at viruses because not all viruses are created equal. So some viruses like poliovirus, uh, like parvo, and there's lots of types of parvo, as the veterinarians will tell you, you have guinea pig parvo, you have canine parvo, you have rat parvo. So not all these viruses have the same susceptibility to disinfectants and sporocytes. So with many of them, it may actually be necessary to use a, a sporocidal agent. So uh, that would be my thoughts on that. Dan, I'm going to turn over to you. I have to step away for just a minute because I uh, my dog's barking. So I'll be right back.
<laughs> All right, Jim, that's exactly right. Um, in terms of doing a, le a risk assessment and, and, and being careful when you're when you're leveraging that data. Uh, because as Jim just said, not all viruses are created equal. When you're talking about these small non-envelope viruses, they're very hard to disinfect. Uh, the envelope viruses are, are very easy. There's a lot of target sites for the disinfectant to hit. So things like uh, COVID and, and HIV, um, one of the hardest things when I had an HIV lab to testing HIV was just keeping it viable long enough to test it, uh, which is a good thing. It's very susceptible to disinfection. But you look at some of these small non-envelope viruses like your norovirus that you that survived for months on a cruise ship, for example, or the, the parvovirus that, that Jim was talking about, there aren't many target sites, so they can be very hard to inactivate. So you can't necessarily assume that because a, a spore site is killing a bacillus subtilis that it's going to inactivate all these viruses. So you would want to do that kind of risk assessment. Uh, look at the virus from a structural point of view, using that hierarchy where you have the small non-envelope viruses that are very, very hard to disinfect, the large non-envelope viruses, which are easier to disinfect, and then the, uh, the, small, uh, the large non-envelope viruses which are easier to disinfect, and then the envelope viruses, which are very easy to disinfect. And look at that criteria as part of your risk assessment, even more so than your biosafety level, um, two versus three. Two, two. Uh, okay, uh, here's another one. Uh, in case of autoclave, you have a standard like Bacillus stereothermophilus is used as a standard organism for challenging. Uh, can there be a worst case organism for the disinfectants too? Is anybody working on this? That's a great question. Um, and so I, I, the assumption would be that if you could kill this type of spore, then you could kill everything else and that would represent you you know that you're going to have effectiveness and, and the short answer is no there's not an easy solution to that but yes people are looking into it one of the hardest to kill spores uh as jim mentioned earlier is bacillus cereus uh, bacillus cereus uh, is is very challenging to disinfect and it's going to be even harder to kill than than bacillus subtilis and, and some other of the of the spore farmers the problem with it is that Bacillus cereus can also be very heterogeneic, very different from strain to strain. So you can have the same species, but different strains. And we've received isolates from different companies as well as ATCC, and there's a lot of difference in the susceptibility profile. So there's never been the ability to find one representative spore that's gonna cover everything below it, um, but it's, it's something that our understanding continues to evolve. Jim, I don't know, you're, you, you certainly know Sirius as well. I don't know if you had a comment. Yeah, Sirius can be serious, Uday. <laughs> it can be a challenge. So uh, I would say that, and we actually see some variants even in the mold spores. Mm -hmm. So we've seen, uh, for example, Catomium, one of Ziva Abraham's favorite organisms, uh, can be very challenging to kill. Uh, and we know from even doing some testing with different mold spores, uh, Aspergillus brasiliensis, it's not exactly easy to kill. So I would say that you see some susceptibility in different ranges there. If we had a virologist on with us here this morning, the virologist would probably say, you can see that same kind of thing with viruses. You may see some of these small non-envelope viruses like Parvo, that can be much greater challenge than even maybe some of the other non-envelope viruses. We, we are far away from that, okay. Uh, uh, this is a question on, you know, how do you exactly uh, use, you know, apply this contact time in routine cleaning? Of course, it's not related with today's thing, but if you could just say a few words about that. Yeah, I can start to address that, and then Dan, uh, you, you can comment on that. Is in the industry, when we talk about contact time, what we're really talking about there is wet contact time. So how long the product is actually wet on the surface while it's killing the bio burden on that surface. So in the industry, we're normally talking about uh, anywhere from a five to 10 minute wet contact time. Most of the disinfectants you'll see uh, will be effective in five minutes or less. Uh, and that's the same story with the sporicides. It's just on rare occasion that we run into a bacterial spore or a mold spore that may take slightly longer than 10 minutes, uh, but I would say the gold standard is probably 10 minutes 
uh, in some cases, you'll, you'll have five minute claims. Dan? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right, Jim. And you wanna make sure your validated contact time is, is what is met in the real world, that you're getting that full uh, 10 minute contact time. If that's the contact time that's been validated, that you have that surface that is wet, it doesn't have to be flooded. It just has to make sure you have it significantly wet for contact for that, for that time. Right. Uh, now, this is a question that when you're doing coupon study, uh, is it essential to consider the temperature? Uh, small changes in temperature, does it affect the coupon studies? That is a, that is a wonderful, wonderful question, whoever asked that, because um, it, yes, temperature is very important for disinfectant activity. Uh, it's basic thermodynamics. Uh, a, a disinfectant is going to tend to be more effective at higher temperatures just because particles are moving around quicker and you're going to get more contact with your microorganism. As far as small differences in temperature, I don't think it makes that big a difference in your study if you're talking 20 degrees C to 22 degrees C to 19 degrees C in that range of maybe 20 to 25, what we would consider room temperature. It's not that essential. It's certainly something you want to document. It's something you want to monitor and something you want to keep consistent. But those small differences probably aren't going to have that great of an impact on the outcome of your study. Now, if you're going down to refrigeration temperatures, for example, maybe you want to test at five degrees C, um, that's when you really have to be thinking about the impact of temperature on your disinfectant efficacy because a, a disinfectant under refrigeration temperatures is not going to perform the same as a disinfectant at room temperature. Jim, did you want to add? Uh, I completely concur with Dan on that. I would also say that if in the real world, in your clean room, you're applying a disinfectant and using hot WFI, so 40 to 80 degrees C WFI, uh, you probably want to do your testing maybe in a in a steam bath or in a with hot water included so that you're under those warm conditions. Uh, same is true if you're doing work with a, um, a blood fractionation site or a cold room at minus five degrees C to five degrees C, you probably want to simulate that in a refrigerator or an ice bath because with in relation to your coupon studies, you want to be sure that you're mimicking those adverse conditions in the clean room uh, when you're doing your testing. And I think Dan, I mean, said it good, right on target. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's the bigger temperature difference, not, not the smaller ones, which will affect. Fine. Uh, no, this is a very uh, interesting question. Uh, can these studies of disinfectant uh, efficacy and uh, qualification and validation, it's quite time consuming. Uh, can it be done at the disinfectant manufacturer's end? Uh, Dan, go ahead. You can probably take that. Uh, yeah, I mean, these, these studies don't have to be contracted out. Um, they certainly can be done within any qualified micro lab. I would again caution to make sure that you have experience and training with doing these types of studies because they are time consuming. That's that's absolutely true. And they can uh, they can give you false results if, if you're not completely trained. Jim, I think you're still sharing your screen there. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I sent an email that popped up, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, they are time consuming. They can be done, you know, internally as well as at a contract lab, as long as you make sure that you have the right uh, trained personnel and experience with the methods. Jim, would you concur with that? Yeah, and many of the disinfectant manufacturers have contract labs. We have one. It's AST Labs up in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. We also have a satellite lab in uh, China. And uh, these labs can actually do disinfectant coupon tests. Uh, so I would definitely recommend, you know, we can certainly, we'd be uh, glad to consult with you on any, you know, coupon-based testing you were wanting to do uh, and can give you our thoughts on it and feedback on it. Thank you. Uh, when the vendor has already done DET validation at his end with USB listed organisms, why should customer again need to validate the same we will well, validate, well, why can't we validate only by using in-house isolates? Uh, will this approach be accepted by regulators? Yeah, let me take a stab at that and then I'll turn it to Dan. Uh, in the industry, what we see is 
Uh, I think regulators have gone all the way back to 1993, where you've seen warning letters and 483s from the FDA, uh, where they're looking uh, for pharma, biotech, med device companies to do some type of validation. And I think the expectation is, number one, uh, that you've done testing with your environmental isolates. That's always going to be number one with the coupon testing. Uh, but many of them, when they do these coupon studies, also include reference strains. So those reference strains can be from ATCC, USDA, and many times if you check with your disinfectant manufacturer like us, we have done a bunch of additional testing with the disinfectants with these ATCC strains, which hopefully will reduce the amount of testing you need to do by around 30 to 40%. So that is typically an aspect of the testing, but I do agree that the number one important thing is that you've done some testing with your environmental isolates. And I would actually say um, kind of an important point here, if you haven't done testing with your environmental isolates, that's something FDA is paying close attention to when they look at those studies. And the other thing they're paying close attention to is that you've done some of these in-situ field trials. So if you're lacking both of those pieces of data, I would think that you could be, you know, suspect to a 483, maybe even a warning letter. So Dan? Yeah, that's exactly right, Jim. I think you do. You can leverage data that exists that's, say, common surfaces and reference strains. I mean, if you have data from your supplier on, on the exact same type of stainless steel and say it's ATCC Staph Aurea 6538, use that data. But of course, then as part of your analysis, make sure you're looking at supplementing that. It's not going to be everything with in-house isolates, critical surfaces, other things that are particular to your operation. Absolutely. You can always uh, uh, use that data and supplement it. Uh, does the requalification of disinfectant uh, requ uh, require surface challenge test too uh, when you are requalifying it? Yeah, so when you're looking at requalifying, let's say you have a new mold like uh, Catomium or Aspergillus pop up in your clean room, uh, you would probably look at repeating that uh, coupon study with that specific mold isolate. Um, and then you may even want to do an additional field trial if you have a shutdown or construction event or power failure where you can easily gather that data uh, where you think that isolate could be present. So I would suggest that, and again, every five to seven years, you want to take a look at all your old data uh, from coupon studies and field trials and make sure that if there were issues, say, with the controls or neutralization or something like that, you may need to repeat it. Dan? That's exactly right, Jim. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, okay, this is about coupons now. Uh, you know, can you give some comments about preparation of coupons? You know, if the surface is not smooth, you're not able to sterilize it, you can only sanitize it. What are the best practices in coupon preparation? Yeah, so there's there's uh, really two main steps to, well, three main steps to preparing your coupons. One is to make sure that you're getting the, a representative sample. Jim talked about reaching out to the supplier, say it's your flooring supplier, to send you some samples. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have the, the right material. And then second is, of course, cutting it and getting it down to that manageable size. And there are companies out there that, that can laser cut surfaces for you and help prepare those coupons. It's not necessarily something you need to go in with a, with a jigsaw in your, in your uh, shop floor to try to do um, to make sure that you're getting that cut as smooth as possible through the latest techniques. And then the third component is the sterilization. Uh, obviously autoclaving is best if the coupon can survive it because you know you're gonna kill everything. If you can't autoclave it, what I would typically recommend is to soak it with a sporicide, like a parasitic acid hydrogen peroxide blend. Make sure you leave it for an extensive period of time to kill any microorganisms that could be on that surface that could contaminate your study. And then after that, rinse it and come back with an IPA application, just to make sure that you have no residue or no carryover from your sporicide prior to using it in your study. And of course, you're gonna to need to have a sterility control within your test to make sure that you have no problems. Thank you. Uh, could you comment on what is the acceptable uh, recovery percentage 
any standards on that when you're doing the recovery study? Dan, that would probably be a good one for you. For the, I guess, um, in, I, in terms of recovery studies, are we talking about like the neutralization effectiveness? Or are we talking about the... Uh, I think they're talking about, my guess is, and I don't know, Uday, uh, but I think they're talking about recovery with the glass beads or with the sonication vortexing step. Yeah, there, there's not a real good control written into the ASTM methodologies that establish a calculation of exactly what was put on the surface versus exactly what was recovered, to my knowledge, Jim. Okay. I, I, guess, I, don't know. This I guess one other point I would add to that is uh, I do know in the past I've heard that recoveries, uh, when customers try to recover from coupons with RODAC plates or swabs, I have heard they get very low numbers. So sometimes recovery with the RODAC plates on the, on the coupons, they're getting numbers like 40%, 50% recovery, which I hear is really low. But I do believe that, and I think, Dan, maybe you can speak to this, I do think that the gold standard in industry for recovery methods for coupon testing is either sonication, vortexing, or with the European method, it'd be the glass beads. Those are the three that I hear about the most that are most effective. Yeah, and ASTM, we actually did some some work, uh, Committee E3515, to look at sonication and vortex as a, as a recovery method, and that was the gold standard uh, that we were able to find. And of course, there's factors that go into that as well. You know, if you, you have to use the sonicating bath correctly, make sure that things are suspended at the right volume with the liquid in the sonicator bath, that you're vortexing at the right speed. Vortex too fast, you're going to shoot your carrier out the side of your glass tube. If you vortex too slow, you're going to uh, not get good recovery. So, yeah, Jim, I do think that's the certainly the gold standard. Okay, so... Uh, let's take here. There are several questions, but I don't think we'll be able to go through all of them. Let's take this as the last one. Uh, can you comment on, you know, uh, coupons for sterile hand gloves, uh, selection methodology and testing? So coupon selection for gloves, was that what you were yes. asking? Yes, yes. So in the industry, one of the things that has been happening for the past, say, 15 to 20 years is use representative surfaces from the clean room and one of the surfaces you would use as a representative surface because a lot of operators are in the clean room and they do sanitize the gloved hands with IPA or ethanol. So getting samples of that rubber or nitrile glove uh, and cutting samples of it for the testing, that is very commonly done. Uh, the other uh, surface I see brought in and tested a lot, and Dan, I know you can comment on this, are the uh, gloves that are used in glove boxes, isolators, and in wraps, you know, where you put your glove in, you're doing manipulations. If you happen to be using, uh, let's say, IPA in there or maybe spore cleanse in there, disinfectant, uh, you would want to show that it's effective on the outside of those glove surfaces so you take representative samples for that testing. Dan? Yeah, that's exactly right, Jim. My only advice there is when you're working with some of these materials that are very light, make sure you're talking to your test lab because you're going to want some kind of system to hold it in place um, because it can be hard to work with a, a very thin uh, coupon material like a, like those types mm -hmm. of blood materials. Um, but yeah, you, you're, you're going to want to think about that. Thank you. So, Jim and Dan, thank you so much for excellent presentation and answering so many questions. And before we say bye-bye uh, to our delegates, uh, concluding remarks from both of you. And with that, then we'll close the webinar. And Richard, if you're there, even if you'd like to say a few words. I just want to say thank, thank you. Thank you. Ahead, for, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the time and, and attention this morning. I really enjoyed it. I just have two things to say. Richard and Dan are the best. And then the last thing I want to say, if you need any of the references, Uday, uh, we're happy to share them. Thank you. Richard, you would like to say a few words? Yeah, I just want to say thank you uh, for the excellent presentation and also hope everyone can gain uh, the knowledge from this. I uh, hope to have uh, more webinars uh, for the Indian uh, ISP events. 
Yeah, and I have another one, Uday, uh, to suggest to you and Richard. I'll, I'll shoot you an email, and it, it involves Dan and I. Okay. Okay, great. That will be right. fine. We look, we look forward to that. So, delegates, thank you for joining in today for this uh, webinar. Uh, with this, we are closing this webinar. Stay safe, stay at home, and follow all the directions issued by your government. We'll meet next weekend for another interesting webinar, uh, which is on quality by design, product development, and lifecycle management in association with IPEC US. See you next week. Bye-bye and good evening.